A revered Chicago institution is wrestling with its past. In tonight's cover story, WGN's Gaynor Hall takes a look at one of the tools that fueled segregation in Chicago and why the president of the Newberry Library is speaking out about it now. And we've decided to move into our house because my father, he earned it brick by brick. Lorraine Hansberry was the first black woman writer to have a play produced on Broadway, A Raisin in the Sun, inspired by her family's own experience with segregation in Chicago's Woodlawn neighborhood, right here at 61st and Rhodes. Hansberry versus Lee, the case involving her father, made it to the Supreme Court in 1940. It was a legal battle over a restrictive covenant designed to keep black people out of the neighborhood. Members of these properties owner associations, which were business owners, real estate agents, and others would go door to door. They needed a certain percentage of property owners on a block or in a neighborhood to sign these restrictive covenants in order for them to become active. The use of restrictive covenants was widespread in Chicago. Just look at this flyer from the 1930s. The Near North Side Property Owners Association warning of a very grave situation, saying the population of black residents in the area was growing by leaps and bounds. A map highlights where they lived in red. The association asked every property owner in the district to agree to sell and rent to white people only. It is unthinkable, it says, that we sit idly by and permit the district to be occupied by a race alien to the men and women who've established their homes and businesses here. There's hate-filled propaganda um, that's really trying to incite fear among property owners in the neighborhood. Daniel Green is the president and librarian at the Newberry Library. The Newberry was founded in 1887 with a, a bequest from uh, Walter Newberry, and we've been in uh, this building on Walton Street since 1893. We have a range of collections spanning over 600 years. Among the collections is a folder called Negro Restriction Agreements. At one point, the Newberry owned more than 30 residential properties in Chicago and a few suburbs, and... There is evidence in our own institutional archive of multiple, um, multiple properties on which we signed restrictive covenants. Say his name! George Floyd! After the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd last year, witnessing the unrest in the streets and cries for justice... Green felt it was time to publish an article acknowledging the ugly chapter of the library's own history. As we look back today, 80 years later, it's quite disturbing to see that the Newberry was um, complicit at this time in structural and institutional racism in the neighborhood. I think it's really impossible for us to move forward without having a full reckoning of the past. Mary Patillo, an African-American studies and sociology professor at Northwestern University, says restrictive covenants were among many tools used to maintain exclusion. We can't talk about restrictive covenants without also talking about uh, the role of the federal government or the in, in not insuring mortgages in neighborhoods that were uh, transitioning racially or in predominantly uh, black neighborhoods. We can't talk about restrictive covenants without talking about the banks. Many institutions, banks played a huge role in um, participating in redlining and continuing to participate in redlining and then in a kind of green lining by opening up neighborhoods for predatory lending. I think that the restrictive covenants are critical for understanding the level of segregation that we still see in Chicago today. A 1937 tax document valued Newberry properties at more than $400,000, what would be roughly $5 million today. Most of the library's real estate was sold by the 50s. Many of those locations today are home to high-priced developments with construction cranes towering in the background. I think one of the most important legacies of restrictive covenants is that it set in motion our expectations for separate living. So the fact that neighbors, white neighbors, could 
and did expect to not have to uh, and to resist black neighbors is something that we see repeated today in all kinds of fights around the exclusion of affordable housing. Truth matters deeply to us here. Green says confronting history is a difficult but necessary step. What I hope is that our owning up to our own past, our the Newberry telling the truth about its own past becomes a signal of our desire to become a more diverse, equitable and inclusive institution. And he hopes other institutions will do the same. In Woodlawn, the Hansberries were threatened by white neighbors. A brick thrown through the window almost hit Lorraine. The family was forced to move, though her father did win the Supreme Court case on a technicality. In a later case in 1948, racially restrictive covenants were struck down, but the legacy lives on. See, we, we come from a long line of proud people. As Lorraine Hansberry's work endures. Gaynor Hall, WGN News.